Hi, this is Nadine Grzkoyak, the Gluten-Free RN, and today we're going to talk about the introduction to celiac disease and gluten intolerance. Believe it or not, I waited to the fourth episode to give you this very important information, but we're going to get to it today. I'm Nadine Grzkoyak. I'm a registered nurse and have been for the last 25 years. I also got my brain back after I went on a gluten-free diet and decided to go back to school. And I got my BSN, which is a Bachelor's of Science in Nursing. And for the duration of my career, I have been a CEN, which means I've been certified in my specialty, which was emergency nursing, which of course I did for 17 years around the state of Oregon. And I loved my job in the emergency department. I did emergency trauma and critical care, and I had so much fun uh, working with people in the emergency department, my peers, my colleagues, and also the patients that came in. It was very harrowing at times, but it was a fabulous job for me, and I really, really, really enjoyed the skills that I I learned that have very well served me now as the gluten-free RN. And since 2000, let's see, February 2007, I have actually been trademarked as the gluten-free RN. So I worked in the emergency department for those 17 years, believe it or not, 10 years on the night shift. So I put in my dues, I paid my dues, let's put it that way. And now I am doing something I love almost even more, which is educating people about gluten intolerance and celiac disease and everything that that entails. So I've written a book, I have had a website, I'm, like I said, trademarked as the gluten free RN. And I've also had um, the opportunity to give almost over 2,000 lectures on gluten intolerance and celiac disease to various audiences. And I love that part of my job. Believe it or not, I never ever in my wildest dreams believed that I would be a public speaker and or a professional speaker on any topic, let alone food, because it is a huge leap to go from emergency trauma and critical care to talking about food. But really, honestly, that's the leap I I made professionally and personally, because I had to because I found out I had celiac disease myself. And it's very difficult to go into work in the emergency department or in hospitals, and see people that actually have celiac disease. But you know, it's really hard to get some practitioners to either test for celiac disease, or more shockingly, believe it exists. So I'm still working on that, just still trying to educate people. And today we're going to educate you about the introduction to celiac disease and gluten intolerance, what those terms mean, and what they might mean to you. Because celiac disease is a considered at this point to be a genetic disorder, which means you have to have the genes that predispose you to have celiac disease. Interestingly enough, about 30 to 50% of the population carries these genes. And those two genes are noted to be HLA, human leukocyte antigen, DQ2, and or DQ8. The genetic component of celiac disease is important, but there are still some people that actually don't carry the DQ2 or DQ8 genes and still have celiac disease. What does that mean? They actually have documented villus atrophy. So there's other things, a few other things that can cause villus atrophy. At some future episode, we'll go over those. But today we're going to focus on the fact that In order to have celiac disease proper, in order to have a diagnosis of celiac disease, you have to be a DQ2 and or DQ8 gene carrier and have documented villus atrophy. Hmm. We'll talk a lot more about documented villus atrophy in just a little bit. The other interesting thing about celiac disease is that it is chronic. It never goes away. You don't suddenly wake up in in the morning and don't have it anymore. It's not going to be cured, despite what some practitioners actually tell their patients. It doesn't go away. And so really what we want to focus on is being 100% gluten-free for the rest of your life. It's not a death sentence, believe it or not. It can actually, a lot of people start to feel better and become more alive. Like I said, they get their brains back and they don't feel pain as much as they used to. Like their bodies don't hurt. 
So it is chronic. It's a lifelong issue. And you have to be, again, on a 100% gluten-free diet. Not that big of a deal. It really should be relatively simple. They used to tell children in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, and 50s when they were actively diagnosing celiac disease in children that they would grow out of it. They thought it was a, a kind of like a regular allergy where they would just grow out of it like a peanut allergy for some people or some other IgE-mediated mediated antibody allergy. But the reality is, is that it is chronic. It's a lifelong condition. It doesn't go away. And we really, really do just have to be 100% or on a gluten-free diet, or as Dr. Ford likes to say, gluten zero. Now, celiac disease is considered to be an autoimmune issue, which means your body attacks itself. So those gluten proteins, the wheat, barley, and rye, are very long proteins that we as human beings have no enzymes to break down. So that's the gluten protein. And even if it does get broken down, there is no benefit to us as human beings. We don't have any enzymes to break it down, like I said. And so those proteins either pass through and don't cause any damage, or at some point there's a trigger event. And that trigger event can be a cold, a virus, pregnancy, it can be uh, traveling, so a stress to your system. It can be an injury. Some people have had head injuries. There's many, many, many different ways that people get triggered into celiac disease proper. And what that means is those proteins are not benign anymore. They don't just pass through. At this point, they start to cause inflammation and your body to attack itself. Not a good idea. Let's talk about the digestive tract because that's initially where the damage starts. So let's just say you eat gluten and it passes through for a number of years, but at some point there is a trigger event. You are a gene carrier of the DQ2 or DQ8 gene. And I highly recommend that people actually find out whether you're a gene carrier and any doctor can order that test or there's several options for ordering that test by yourself, either over the internet through enterolab.com or glutenpro.com. It doesn't have to be super expensive. The Enterolab genetic test is $149, and that will also give you the gluten sensitivity genes, and which include the DQ2 and DQ8 genes, but there's other gluten sensitivity genes. And the Gluten Pro is a company out of Canada. Their test is about little less than 200. I think it's 198. And the Enterolab test is 149. So if you want to order those on your own, you certainly can do that. Or if you have insurance or you have Medicare or Medicaid, then you want to have your doctor order it so that it's paid for. But it's a good thing to find out because a lot of people are finding out their genetic status at this point after their families have been sick for a long period of time and they find out their they're gene carriers, either homozygous, which means they're pretty much guaranteed to have celiac disease and they're going to have a harder time recovering when they finally do go on a gluten-free diet. So your digestive tract is about 30 feet long. That varies a little bit from person to person. It starts in your mouth, ends at your rectum, and it's pretty much a closed system. So what you eat is actually, believe it or not, on the outside of the environment. It's not truly part of your body because there's a lot of mechanisms that maintain the integrity of your intestines and your GI tract so that a lot of the things that we consume or we eat or that we're exposed to actually just pass through because our bodies don't need them as either fuel or uh, water for hydration. So a lot of those things that we consume actually pass through and our body doesn't even use them. But there's a lot of things that we consume that our body wants to keep on in that tube and outside of the inside of our body, if that makes sense. So you have your mouth and then you swallow and you have your esophagus, goes down to your stomach. Stomach acid is very important. We'll talk about that uh, at a future episode also. And then right below your stomach is the duodenal bulb followed by the duodenum, thereby followed by the jejunum and the ileum, and then the colon. And then you have your rectum and or anus, excuse me, your rectum and your anus. And that's uh, how we excrete our stool or the poop to the outside. 
And but it's very natural. Everybody does it. Is everybody should have that book that says everybody poops because we all do. And it's just very fascinating how the food that we consume gets utilized by our body so that for fuel and energy. But what the doctors are looking for, and this is a very important term, it's called villus atrophy, is when they do an endoscopy, they put that tube down your throat, past your stomach, into the duodenal bulb, and then they'll go into the duodenum. And what they're looking for, it should look Healthy tissue should look like pink shag carpeting, and it should be wavy like a coral reef and very intact, very tight junctures between every villi. So that's normal tissue. Marsh 1 damage is when the microvilli themselves get destroyed, and those microvilli are the ones that actually excrete the enzymes that break down sugar, sucrase, and lactase. So it breaks down the sugar in milk. A lot of people should consider that if they are lactose intolerant, that that might be a red flag that they actually are gluten intolerant or have celiac disease. Again, there's huge populations that cannot digest milk because they lack that enzyme. So if the microvilli are destroyed as in Marsh 1 damage, then it would just make sense that these people are all tested for celiac disease. Marsh 2 and Marsh 3 damage or when the villi themselves, the larger part of that finger-like projection, start to bend over or fold over, they blunt, they atrophy. So villus atrophy. And those tight junctures open up. The tight junctures are part of your immune system, and it's part of what keeps those everything that does not belong in your bloodstream or your body can't utilize in the GI tract. Marsh 4 damage is when those villi are completely gone. You have red inflamed edematous tissue, which means it's waterlogged. So it looks a lot like a sponge. Some people will call this leaky gut. We in the medical profession call it increased permeability of your intestinal wall. That's not a good thing because if your intestines are damaged, so is your immune system. And it's extremely important to have a healthy immune system for a number of reasons. The other problem with the leaky gut or increased permeability of your intestinal wall is the things that should be staying in your GI tract and getting excreted actually are allowed to get into your bloodstream, including the long chain amino acid proteins, the gluten, um, which can cause damage to every organ in your body, including your brain. Because if you have a leaky gut, you don't just have a leaky gut or increased permeability of your intestinal wall. You actually have a leaky blood-brain barrier, leaky lungs, leaky skin. Anywhere that there is tissue that is an epithelial tissue, Those that tissue can be damaged, believe it or not, from what you eat. So it's extremely important that we actually maintain our health if we can. And sometimes for a lot of us, it means being on a gluten-free diet for our entire lives. Because for a lot of us, that's the only way to heal up the damage from the gluten. So once those proteins are in your bloodstream, the gluten is in traveling around your body in your bloodstream because you have a leaky gut, it can wreak havoc on every organ in your body, including your brain. So we want to prevent that damage if at all possible. But of course, the damage from the gluten doesn't just happen in your small intestines. It can happen anywhere in that GI tract. And we'll talk more about that. But if you're missing all those villi, that's how you absorb all of your nutrients in various parts of your small intestine. In your duodenum, your jejunum, your ileum, the vast majority of your nutrients get absorbed in those parts of your small intestine. So we want to keep them healthy because if they're unhealthy or you have villus atrophy, then we have issues with malabsorption, which means your body can't absorb the nutrition out of the food that you're eating. So even if you think you're on a super good nutritious diet, if you're still eating gluten and you have celiac disease or gluten sensitivity or non-celiac gluten sensitivity, then you're not able to absorb any of those nutrients. So a lot of people look like they're malnourished but some people don't. Some people actually are obese or they look like they have, they're have they perfectly healthy. But the reality is, is that damage on the inside, whether you know it or not, is still happening. And personally, I really wish somebody would have told me sooner. 
Now I'm, I'm working my way over 10 years to better health. I'm much healthier as a 50-year-old woman than I've ever been in my life. I run marathons. I climb mountains. I do all kinds of fun things and hike all over. I travel a lot. And I thought I was super healthy before. I really did. I worked in the emergency department for those 17 years, and I thought I had a super immune system. And looking back, that's not so much the case. Now, I didn't really miss a day of work, but my body was always struggling in one way or another. But because I'm Polish, and I am, my last name is still Gryskowiak, we're pretty, we're pretty um, stoic, and we just, you know, plow through. That's, that's my kind of our motto. Just kind of plow through. You get up in the morning, and you just get it done. Whatever work needs to happen. So, Again, it would just would have been a good idea for me to know sooner before I was 40 that I and almost dead that I had celiac disease. But that's my story. That's that's how it played out. So if you have an opportunity to get tested sooner, please, please, please do that and make sure that your family is tested also. So those remember those villi that I was talking about, the villus atrophy? If you have healthy tissue and that is your immune system, so we're going to talk about that for a second. 70 to 90% of your immune system is in your intestines. So you can begin to understand why it's so important to have healthy intestinal tissue. And most of us, and I I would say like 99.9% of us have never seen the insides of our intestines. I can't even imagine most people seeing the inside of your your intestines unless you do a pill cam, which is a, a little pill that you swallow or is placed in your GI tract and takes pictures of your intestinal tract all the way through. But most of us don't get that opportunity to get those pictures taken. And so we have to assume that our symptoms that we're experiencing day in and day out all come from something that's going on in our intestines. And Hippocrates knew that all diseases start in the gut. So we really want to pay attention to our intestines and we can't see them. They only let us know really when there's something wrong, like we're constipated or we have diarrhea or we're vomiting. And otherwise, we don't pay very much attention to them. But it's extremely important that we start to pay attention to them, uh, the GI tract and the intestines, because it is 70 to 90 percent of your immune system. And I like to equate it to soldiers, and I've heard this uh, a couple times, is that If you have healthy villi and everything's good and those long finger-like projections are intact, that's great. Those soldiers on the top, and we're going to equate our immune system to the soldiers, have had eight hours of sleep. They've had their coffee in the morning. The sky is blue. Their guns are loaded and everything's perfect. So when an antigen goes by or something that does not belong in your GI tract, they go, hey, who wants to take that out? Who actually wants to, you know, make it go away? Because we, it doesn't belong here. We recognize it doesn't belong here and it, it just needs to be taken care of. That's a healthy GI tract and the villa are intact and your soldiers are armed. They're ready to go. They can see what an antigen is and identify it and take care of it. That's a very healthy immune system. When you have marsh two, three, or four damage, that immune system doesn't work so well. It's unbalanced. There's components that are missing. So those soldiers, on the other hand, have been on a week-long bender. There's no coffee to be had. Their guns may or may not be loaded, and they're trying to operate in smoke and fire. They're trying to pick out antigens and things in their environment where they can't really see them because the the inflammation and the the other difficulties of identifying antigens or things that don't belong in your GI tract. So if they can't really see the antigen, identify it, a lot of people actually end up having allergies to things that just don't make any sense. And those T cells, this is a T cell mediated antibody response, just start maybe firing. And they're like, well, we don't know what we're firing at, but heck, we can't see it. We can't really identify it, but you know, we're just going to shoot at it. So not a good way to have your immune system operating. So it can either be tempered down and not working really effectively, or 
overstimulated, over responsive to various things. So again, it's extremely important to have healthy intestines so that your immune system is healthy. That's the goal. So gluten intolerance or non-celiac gluten sensitivity are not all that different from celiac disease. It's considered that anybody that doesn't carry a DQ2 or DQ8 gene is actually gluten intolerant or has non-celiac gluten sensitivity. They could have the same symptoms, but if they don't actually don't have those genes, then they're considered to um, have something else. A lot of people just go on a gluten-free diet. They might not be gene carriers, but they know that they feel better as soon as they go on a gluten-free diet. And there's some benefit to that. And I highly encourage people, if they can't get tested or they don't want to get tested, whatever, that they actually just go ahead and go on a gluten-free diet and see how their body reacts, if it feels better. Because really, there's some validity that's a clinical trial of being on a gluten-free diet. The interesting thing is a lot of people will go on a gluten-free diet for a week or two, or they'll cheat and they'll go, well, I didn't really get better. I tried that gluten-free diet thing. The reality is if you have intestinal damage or you have villus atrophy, it takes six months to a year for that villus atrophy to reverse. And your body wants to get better. Our bodies are remarkable at regenerating and healing, but you have to remove the thing that is actually causing the damage to occur in the first place. So remove the gluten. For most of us, you have to take out dairy too, because even if you do heal up your intestines, a lot of us still cannot break down those proteins in the milk. So you'll hear a lot of people are on a gluten-free, casein-free diet, including autistic kids, because our bodies tend to read those proteins the same because molecularly they are very similar. What are gluten grains? Well, wheat, barley, rye, and I put in oats mostly because of the cross-contamination. It's the fields they're grown in, the silos they're stored in, the trains they're transported in, the facilities they're processed in, there's lots of opportunity for cross-contamination with the gluten-containing grains, which are wheat, barley, and rye. And all of the subfamilies of wheat, including spelt, satan, semolina, couscous, durum, camet, bulgur, farina, emmer, graham, and I really, really, really don't care if they're sprouted or soaked or it doesn't really matter. Those proteins are still there. They're extremely durable and very difficult to actually break down. They do get denatured a little bit, but not very much. So the barley and barley malt, and then rye. You'll start to see variations of wheat and a lot of these used in different ways or identified in packages in different ways. And please just be aware that um, you're going to see more in different names, it kind of in, in order to confuse people, which is I find a little concerning. We should really be identifying these grains pretty much from the get-go. It should be on um, big letters on every package because this is such a health concern. It's a public health crisis at this point that we need to identify the gluten grains because for a lot of people, they are actually poison and they have to be looked at that way as a toxin. So gluten-free grains and flours, we have lots of options. I myself am on a paleo diet. So I look to the nut flours, such as chestnut flour, almond flour, coconut, hazelnut, pecan. And if you are going to eat the grain flours, I highly recommend that you stick with teff and quinoa or focus on them. Teff and quinoa are extremely nutrient dense. And a lot of what we talk about in healing people nutritionally is making sure that they have nutrient-dense foods. And you'll hear me say that over and over and over again. But nutrient-dense grain flours, would the two that I would focus on again are tough and quinoa. And anytime you can get tough or quinoa in a whole grain format, that's much better. Legume flours are okay. A lot of people consider them to be pretty grainy and heavy. So chickpeas, fava beans. There's other seed flours like millet and buckwheat. Buckwheat, despite the name, it actually isn't wheat. It's part of the rhubarb family. Amaranth, which is a tiny grain, but it's really pretty. The plant, if you ever see it, it's purple. It's gorgeous. And rice, corn, millet, sour gum, sorghum, excuse me. And then the tuber flowers, which would be potato, tapioca, and arrowroot. Also your starches. 
So there's lots of opportunity here to get creative in the kitchen. There's lots of recipe books, uh, cookbooks on how to use these grains effectively so that you can either recreate the recipes that you want or move in a totally different creative direction with what you're eating. Where does gluten hide? Well, welcome to America. Uh, we tend to put gluten in a lot of things or grains. So it's in your shampoos and conditioners, hydrolyzed vegetable protein, hydrolyzed wheat protein, hydrolyzed, I even saw barley protein in a shampoo, interestingly enough. So be very aware that there's different ways that the gluten will get into a lot of your personal care products. And it does matter what you put on your skin. We'll talk, we'll do a whole episode on skin, maybe two, but licorice candies, gums, and chocolates, stamps and envelopes. And a lot of people will say, oh, those envelopes, they're, they're perfectly fine. Well, a couple concerns. Number one, not all envelopes are made in the United States, so we really, really, really don't know what that glue is made out of. They don't come labeled. And a couple of years ago, there were some women that actually got sick right around the holidays. And the only thing that had changed, the only thing that was different, and we really have to be, you know, sluice to find out where people are getting gluten sometimes, is they had sent out their Christmas cards and licked those envelopes. And they got sick. They got gluten. It's virtually impossible to remove that glue from your tongue once it's there. So I do recommend that people get the self-sticking stamps and envelopes. Lipsticks and cosmetics, beer, tea, distilled liquor. There's more and more distill distilleries that are actually using corn for some of their um, alcoholic beverages. But if it does have grains in it, I would highly recommend that people stay away from it. Even though the distillation process should take out all those proteins, I've heard it over and over and over again throughout the years that people drink whiskey or they drink something that's a grain-based alcohol and they get sick, much sicker than they should be sick um, just from drinking the alcohol itself. Deli meats and sausages, but you'll see more and more deli meats and sausages say they're gluten-free. Play-Doh glue and candy for children primarily, but please do be aware that Play-Doh actually is a wheat-based product. And even if kids don't um, have a reaction just from playing with it, some kids will eat Play-Doh. <laughs> um, it's not unheard of. They glue too. And French fries, those should just be potatoes, right? Well, it's the it's the oil that they're fried in. So if anything else goes in that oil, then that oil is contaminated. So things like that are breaded or beer battered, those proteins are extremely heat stable. Like I said earlier, they're very difficult to denature. And even if they do get broken down, they're still just fractionated. So it's still a very potent source of cross-contamination. So just be aware if the place that you're getting French fries is actually a designated, um, has a designated gluten-free fryer. Soy sauce, soups, and sauces. Uh, there, again, there's lots of opportunity to get alternatives for those products. And then every time you get your prescriptions filled, you need to have the pharmacist check those medications every time because they will source the medications from different, different sources. And the, the pharmacist really, their job is to make sure that you're getting a safe medication for you. That's their job. So please remind them of that if they if they say they don't want to check it every time. So it's extremely important because it's a very common cause of cross-contamination. And then, of course, the vitamins. I like, for vitamins myself, I like the Country Life. They're certified gluten-free. And it's what I have in my cupboards. There's other, there's lots of other um, gluten-free, certified gluten-free supplements and vitamins and whatnot. There's Pure and Thorn. Most of those you have to get through a uh, provider, but the Country Life is easily accessible to most people. They do have it online. Uh, our local vitamin stores carry it. So it's easily accessible and not tremendously expensive. It's why I recommend it. The big question is, what can I eat? And we're going to end on this today, and then we're going to pick it up again for the second episode. Oh, excuse me, the fifth episode. But Fresh fruits and vegetables, plain meats and fish, which means they're not breaded or beer battered or anything. 
but roasted or seasoned with fresh spices and whatnot and grilled. Any beans or legumes, which are kidney black garbanzos, the list goes on and on. Peanuts and tree nuts, but I am encouraging people to to not eat peanuts and to stay away from them. It is a legume. Um, tree nuts are fine. There's lots of options for tree nuts, is including almonds, hazelnuts, uh, macadamia nuts, plus any of those tree nuts can actually be made into nut butters, very nutrient dense. Rice, corn, and potatoes, brown rice and uh, sweet potatoes are much more nutrient dense because they have more color. So every once in a while, you might have some white rice or uh, white potatoes. But if you can focus on uh, sweet potatoes, yams for potatoes, and then look for wild rice, brown rice, if you're going to use those. Safe grains, and we uh, talked about some of those. And then the dairy products. If you can do dairy, I myself am not consuming any dairy, but there's a great new product line called Kite Hill, K-I-T-E-H-I-L-L. It used to only be available at Whole Foods, but now it has become more widely available at different stores, such as Natural Grocers and the co-ops. So if you have a co-op in your area, you can ask them to carry the line of Kite Hill almond milk based products that they make cheeses and yogurts and they're really, really, really good. And products that are certified gluten-free and you'll see that from the, which is GIG, the Gluten Intolerance Group of North America has a certification process and it if a product is certified gluten-free, it means that that product has actually been certified to less than 10 parts per million. And that might not sound like a lot, but some people still get sick from even that minute amount. And all it takes is less than a breadcrumb to trigger the same autoimmune response to get kicked in again. And that really is why we are so careful about avoiding gluten because all it takes is that breadcrumb or a dusting of flour. So cross-contamination is a huge issue. But there's lots of great things to eat. So on that note, and a lot of great things to eat, I'm going to end this episode, episode four. So come back for episode five, when we're going to continue the basics for gluten intolerance and celiac disease. And you can find me at www.glutenfreern.com on Instagram, Facebook, I'm all over. And if you or your family are interested in a consultation, please just contact me. I do them over the phone, over Skype. Uh, We can meet in person. I do quite a bit of traveling. So there's lots of opportunity to actually meet with me and you can get any of the insights I've inquired over the last 10 years of seeing patients and clients. And we can figure out maybe what's going on with you. So until next episode, episode five, which by the way, will be released every Friday at 9 a.m. from now on. We will keep being gluten-free. And again, just 100% gluten-free for the rest of your life if you have celiac disease. And let's try to maintain our health because we all want to be healthy as long as we can and have an intact brain and be able to use our bodies effectively. So on that note, we'll see you at episode five. And thank you very much for joining me, Nadine Groskoyak, the Gluten-Free RN. Bye.